If you're a creative professional, videographer, editor, or producer, chances are your footage is scattered everywhere across a graveyard of external SSDs, spinning hard disks, cloud accounts, memory cards. I was in that chaos too. Until finally, I said, enough. This is how I built a 10 gigabit NAS setup to finally take control of my media, streamline my workflow, and give myself that much needed peace of mind. For years, I've relied on portable SSDs from SanDisk and various other manufacturers. I've even used their ProBlade system. I've tried the OWC Thunder Bay 4 for an SSD RAID. I've used spinning hard disks and even an old Synology NAS, which wasn't 10 gig enabled. You name it, I've used it. My footage was everywhere and it worked until it didn't. I've had SSDs fail on me. My Thunder Bay SSD RAID keeps dropping speeds. I was juggling drives for every project, backing up to Backblaze individually, and just spending more time hunting down files and actually editing. If you're working with 4K footage, raw, multicam podcasts, or anything media heavy, you know exactly how fragile and annoying this setup can get. That's when I finally decided to pull the plug on a NAS, a network attached storage. This video is not sponsored. Well, I guess it is because this NAS and all the equipment was purchased by my employer to help me manage their footage. The views are my own and I'm not going to hold back if I don't like something. So let's get into it. So why did I choose the Synology NAS? Well, after diving down rabbit holes, Reddit threads, YouTube videos, and even talking to vendors at the MPTS trade show in London, I chose the Synology DS1821+. Why not Ugreen, Ubiquiti, or QNAP? Well, Ubiquiti's NAS is gorgeous, but underpowered, no SSD cache, limited RAM, and the software is super basic. Ugreen is promising with modern specs and built-in 10G, but the software is still immature and I don't have time for command line workarounds. QNAP builds were just coming in over budget. So at the end of the day, it was Synology's software that convinced me to go that route. It's mature, stable, reliable, and I've already used their products for years with my DS918 that I've had since 2017. Unfortunately, that one doesn't have 10 gigabit ethernet capability, so it was a no-no for editing. Now, some of you might be thinking, why did you go for an older Synology NAS? Well, you only need to type the word Synology into YouTube and you'll come across hundreds of videos of people moaning and fuming at their recent change of policy where you must use Synology branded drives in their newer models. Whilst this is annoying, frustrating and very anti-consumer, for my needs, this model ticks all the boxes. So here's what I got. The Synology DS1821 Plus, four 22 terabyte Toshiba N300 NAS rated drives, I got two Samsung 1TB 990 Pro NVMe SSDs for my cache. I've then got several SATA SSDs, which I already owned for my editing pool, which I'm going to configure in RAID 0. And I upgraded the RAM to 32 gigabytes, which is the maximum that this model officially supports. I also got the Synology 10 gigabit network interface card, which is installed into the PCIe slot on the NAS a Thunderbolt to 10 gigabit adapter from OWC for my MacBook Pro, and a 10 gig network switch so I can connect everything together and get the highest speeds. And then a bunch of cables, which are all Cat 6A rated. So let me walk you through exactly how I set this thing up step by step. First up, I installed the four 22 terabyte drives into the NAS. Synology has this toolless tray system. You just slide off the side rails, insert the drive, label up, click the rails back in and slide them back into the NAS. Now here's my first tip. Keep the packaging for your hard disk because drives are most vulnerable within the first two weeks. Next up, I installed the NVMe SSD cache. These installed directly inside of the NAS in a simple toolless setup. You just simply insert them at an angle and click into place. Then I installed the 10 gigabit network interface card. Now for this, you will need to get your screwdriver out, remove the back panel of your NAS, slot in the card in the PCIe slot and screw it down. Now remember, it's really important when you first boot the NAS that you boot using one of the native one gigabit ethernet ports. The 10 gigabit ethernet NIC is only recognized after disk station manager is installed and set up. Now finally, I mounted three of my SATA SSDs into the drive trays with screws and inserted them into the NAS. I'll configure these later in DSM as a separate RAID 0 pool for high speed editing. Although it turned out this was not as high speed as I first thought it was gonna be. More on that later. Now you may notice I've got four spinning hard drives and three SSDs making a total of seven. This NAS has eight bays. Now I'm actually gonna go out and purchase an additional 22 terabyte hard disk for my own personal use. Then came the network setup. I installed a 10 gig switch, Cat 6A cabling, and I used the OWC Thunderbolt to 10 gig adapter to connect my 
MacBook Pro to the 10 gig network. Now be careful because many cheap 10 gig switches only have one 10 gig port. So if that's your use case and that's all you need, then fine, but make sure you always check the specs. Then it came time to boot up the NAS and set up my RAID. Now I connected the NAS to the switch using the one gigabit native ports. Installing DSM is super easy. You just go to finds.synology.com and any NAS connected to your network will simply show up and you just follow the prompts. Now I'm not gonna go into a detailed step-by-step -step setup on how to do this. There are plenty of videos out there on YouTube from professionals that know more about this stuff than I do. So I suggest you go and follow some of their tutorials. I created a RAID 5 or SHR1 array for my spinning hard disk, which gives me about 60 odd terabytes of free space. I created a RAID 0 pool for the SSDs to maximize my speed, but as I said, I'll talk about the speeds a little bit later. Now it's really important to note that the initialization of your system can take several days. Mine took nearly three. So if you've got large drives, be patient. Don't run any speed tests or stress the system until that is complete. You can, however, create your shared folders, which show up as network drives on your operating system and start copying over footage if you so wish. And then the final step, which should have been the first step, was to install the RAM. And the only reason I did it this way around was because the RAM didn't arrive until several days after the other components. So to do this, you just turn over your NAS unit, make sure you power it down and unplug everything, of course. You pop off a couple of screws on there. You remove the original RAM that was installed, and I think it comes with... Uh, four gigabytes of RAM only, which is relatively small. And I popped in two 16 gigabyte sticks to give me a total of 32 gigs, which is the maximum for this particular model and more than enough for my needs. Oh, and I also configured the SSD cache in read write mode to get the best performance for video editing. Now here's a tip if you're using Mac OS, I found that I had to disable Wi-Fi on my Mac to ensure that my Mac prioritized the 10 gigabit port for connection to the network otherwise it sometimes overrides it with wi-fi and then you're restricted to super slow wi-fi speeds which is not ideal when you're editing large video files now one more crucial item that i haven't done yet but you absolutely must is to get a ups that's an uninterruptible power supply in the event of a power outage a ups gives your nas time to shut down safely or gives you time to shut it down safely avoiding any corruption or loss it's definitely on my to-do list. So how fast does this thing actually go? Well, after initialization, I was impressed. The spinning hard drives gave me write speeds of nearly 900 megabits per second and read speeds of nearly 1000 megabits per second. Now the SSD pool was actually less impressive. Surprisingly, the read and write speeds were very similar and in some cases slightly less than what I was getting from the hard drives. Now, I don't know if this is because I've only got three of them configured, but I figured with 500 read and write on each of them, those combined together in RAID 0 would have given me slightly higher speeds, but I guess I was almost at the capacity of my 10 gigabit ethernet anyway, so I'm happy with what I've got. Now, as you can see, this is more than enough for any kind of video editing that you're gonna throw at it. Unless you're doing 12K, well, then you're probably not using the system anyway. I've been editing 4K and B-roll footage in DaVinci Resolve, and it plays back in real time, full resolution with no issues whatsoever. However, only yesterday, I did notice some slowdowns and some bottlenecks. There seemed to be no CPU or network bottleneck, so I don't know what was quite going on, but it seemed to figure itself out after a few minutes. But I'm going to keep a close eye on that to see if I can figure it out. Okay, well, look, no setup is perfect, and this one certainly isn't. So here's what I don't like. Mac OS network prioritization. Even when setting the service order in network settings, Mac OS thinks it's cleverer than you and it sometimes favors the Wi-Fi over the 10 gig ethernet connection. Well, the fix for this is turning your Wi-Fi off completely, which is a huge downside for me because personally, I use my iPad as a secondary display using the sidecar feature. Now this only works in Wi-Fi or with the iPad hardwired into your Mac. Now with all my ports on my Mac occupied, I've had to ditch the second display which is a bit of a shame. However, I have figured out a solution which I'll discuss in a future video. Heat and noise. I originally purchased the TP-Link 10 gigabit switch, which has got eight 10 gigabit ports. That one was loud. Now I mean really loud. It was like a bee constantly buzzing in my ear. So I decided to swap it out for the Ubiquiti 10 gigabit switch. This is smaller, no fan, no noise, much, much better. But these components get hot. The NAS, the switch, the 10 gigabit Thunderbolt adapter generate a lot of heat, so make sure they are well ventilated. 
Complexity. The initial setup does take some time. You're dealing with firmware upgrades, cabling, configuration, RAID decisions, and backups. If you want plug and play, this is not it. It's not mobile friendly, and by that I mean that if you're always in the road or editing on a plane or in different locations, this setup does not help. Of course, I still use my SSDs when I'm doing shoots, but I dump them onto the NAS when I return, and that workflow works for me. So, is this for you? Well, if you're a creative professional who spends most of their time editing in one place, this is a total game changer. Massive storage, built-in redundancy, centralized access, clean, quiet, real-time 4K editing. Remember, having redundancy is not a backup. I'm using the NAS to store all of my footage, which still needs to be backed up somewhere. I'm gonna be looking into some NAS backup solutions in the future from the likes of Backblaze. It's not cheap, it's not simple, but it's definitely worth it. If you're tired of juggling drives, running out of ports, or constantly asking yourself, where did I put that project? A NAS is definitely the answer. This setup has streamlined my entire workflow, freed up space on my desk, and brought some much needed sanity back to my post-production life. It's 100% worth doing. Just don't forget that UPS.